<clears throat> I think nobody regrets more than I do that Kurt cannot be the master of ceremonies for this afternoon. The three talks we're about to hear differ <clears throat> in many ways from the a series that we've heard up to now, they have much less relationship with each other. And <clears throat> in two of them at least, I can't find a record of what Freeman has published or even said on the subject. That's probably because I've not had time to do any homework. But there is a happier possibility. On most of the summers, of the past four or five decades, I spent several weeks in the same group of offices as Freeman uh, working on various problems <coughs> of scientific nature which are of interest to the government and to the people of the country. Freeman spends some of his time listening to invited speakers say what they think, but most of it he sits by himself concentrating on something, rarely interrupted. <clears throat> and I noticed that the rarer the interruption, the longer the interval between interruptions, the deeper and more to the point it is when Freeman decides to say anything. And so <clears throat> as a physicist, rather than a mathematician, as we heard yesterday, I immediately leap to the limiting case that when you can find an infinite interval between publications, when Freeman has published nothing at all on a subject, it means he knows everything about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I suspect, includes how to fix uh, recalcitrant PowerPoints. Now, <clears throat> the, um, I recently received a vita for the speakers of the three talks <coughs> we're about to listen to. And <coughs> it is customary to begin with a brief summary of the speakers before they make their presentations. Now, the closest in these, these summaries, one speaks of the education, <coughs> the awards, and the positions. And it bears a similarity to what you read in the New York Times, if you go into it that much, every Sunday, about the wedding announcements of people. You learn <coughs> the names of the people about to be wed. You immediately are given their education. You are told their, their uh, uh, awards and their positions. Then you're usually told about the similar, inf similar information about their ex-spouses, <laughs> their mothers, and their fathers. Now, happily, <clears throat> we have invited three speakers who need no introduction. So I'm very tempted to just leave it all at that. Okay? <laughs> However, I'll give you a brief sample of the sorts of things we could be spending time on. Our first <clears throat> speaker will be Sid Drell. Sid <coughs> is a senior fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, professor of theoretical physics emeritus at SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. And for almost 30 years, he was a deputy director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. <coughs> he has a led two lives in physics. One, as a world leader in theoretical elementary particle physics, and the other, as an advisor to numerous government committees and numerous non-government committees on issues of national security, especially of the sort that he'll be talking to us about. Among his awards, there's the National Medal of Science, the Enrico Fermi Award, MacArthur Fellowship, MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, and <coughs> service as a trustee of the Institute for Advanced Study, not necessarily in that order. But, uh, 
Now, for me, the most important quality of Sid that I celebrate is 65 years of a very cherished friendship, which includes some collaborations even on physics papers. In trying to recall any incident of that, uh, I'm reminded of the time <coughs> when the Drells gave our very young children a pussycat. And this pussycat was one among three pussycats which had been offered to them by Sid and his wife and others. One was named Niels. One was named Albert, and they seemed very appropriate to an institute connection. And I actually forget the name of the third, which um, uh, we finally, our children finally decided on. I think if we could transport that to today, it might very well be, and it would be very appropriate if the third one was named Freeman. <laughs> Our first speaker is going to be Sid Dre uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> Sid is going to be talking to us <coughs> on the subject, is it logical to work toward a world without nuclear weapons? Thank you, Mal. First, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the pleasure and the honor of participating in this wonderful ceremony. And secondly, before I start, I have to correct the title. The, the title was, Is It Illogical to Work Toward a World Without Nuclear Weapons? Anyway. Returning to Princeton is a special pleasure for me. I will always remember the first time I stepped off the PJ and B at the Dink on a hot summer day 70 years ago, arriving as a scared new freshman at the university. Why had I chosen Princeton? Well, I had heard about a famous name up here named Albert Einstein. Uh, whom I read about. I was beginning to be interested in the kinds of things he was working on. So I thought, well, Princeton, that must be a good place to go and learn. Obviously, I didn't realize that there were two institutions here. And then an undergraduate arriving at the university uh, uh, was not uh, going to be uh, learning from the great man himself at the institute. <laughs> Nevertheless, I learned that a lot from some excellent mortals at the university. Two years later, 1945, on August 6th, I was in what is often called a legendary room, the conference room in Fine Hall, the math building at Princeton, where people gathered for tea in the afternoon or to play Go all day. Uh, when a uh, very senior mathematics professor walked in and said the following, in just so many words. I hear they just dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima that had destroyed the entire city and its population. I hope they built a second one, put all the people who built the first one on an island and drop it on them. Well, that was quite a shock for me to hear that. My first reaction was to go to the physics library and find out what this nuclear fission was all about, which I didn't know. But soon, very troubling thoughts began to sink in about what could happen to our civilization in the future, if future conflicts were going to be fought with weapons like that one, which delivered more than a thousand times more destructive energy than the biggest bomb used during World War II up till then and we know how devastating its effect was during the bombing raids in Europe. I was, of course, not alone reacting that way. It was soon quite evident through the uh, public as well as scientific activities of many scientists and people in public that this was a concern widely shared, and we now know that it was also widely shared by Freeman. I first became aware of the name Freeman Dyson uh, and of his brilliance as a physicist 
from those two famous papers that Whitney referred to yesterday, which uh, significantly advanced the theory of quantum electrodynamics, which was the fundamental theory at that time. It was 65 years since that early step in Freeman's extraordinarily rich, diverse, and creative career that we're here celebrating. He has been a prominent contributor in so many fields of science that it's hard to identify one in which he hasn't left uh, uh, his indelible remark, uh, mark on, including, including nuclear fission, where he worked on positive impact of propulsion and uh, civilian power and of the great dangers of the weapons that can be made with them. Freeman and I have had for me the pleasure of working together on a number of Jason studies which uh, deal with technical issues of national security, including in particular the bomb. Jason, if you don't know it, is a group of academics uh, created by the government in 1960. And uh, we get away from our academic duties in the summer to work on technical issues of national security. You don't see Freeman's publications in these, as Mao said. But I can tell you his trademark was exactly the same as all the work you know publicly done by Freeman. Creativity, originality, certainly unpredictability, perhaps a touch of contrariness, and uh, an open mind that was willing and able to change its views in response to new findings and developments. I have never known Freeman to walk away from a difficult challenge because it is by anyone considered illogical, which brings me to the title of my talk. Is it illogical to work toward a world without nuclear weapons? This question is both important and timely, and it triggers very controversial and often adversarial responses. For more than 50 years, America's vast arsenal of nuclear weapons has been and still is widely viewed to be essential to our national security. To many of the mandarins of nuclear policy in our country as well as around the world, an initiative to create a world without nuclear weapons is considered to be dangerous as well as misguided fancy, fantasy, fantasy. Why is that? Well, as best as I can understand, they fear it will disturb what they consider a relative calm these days and smooth sailing with our current condition of nuclear deterrence or mutual assured destruction that is mad as it is properly called. But if they arrive at this conclusion, the only way I can think of it is they are uh, not giving proper attention. In fact, they seem to be minimizing, if, totally, if not totally ignoring, a growing danger. With the broad spread of nuclear technology and material, we are now facing an increasingly serious hazard that these weapons may be acquired and used by dangerous leaders and terrorists willing to resort to suicidal actions to achieve their goals. Is it really logical to accept such risks and to put our survival in the hands of rogue leaders or terrorists should they acquire nuclear weapons by whatever means, theft, bribery, or more simply, just acquiring the nuclear fuel, plutonium and enriched uranium. Acquiring that material is by far the most difficult step in building a relatively primitive but deadly effective nuclear weapon. And today, the world is awash in that nuclear fuel. 
How long can we count on continuing to bat 100% and keeping that fuel, much less those deadly weapons, out of the hands of such people and preventing their use? You know, against such dangers, nuclear weapons are no longer much of a deterrent. I can't think of any scenario in which the use of nuclear weapons would be appropriate or effective in dissuading their being used on suicidal missions. On the other hand, I have no trouble thinking about one or two primitive bombs being dropped uh, on a uh, major city. There's a primitive bomb like the Hiroshima one, like New York, London, Paris, Beijing, Moscow, you name it. And what do you think would be the impact on the morning after globally, especially in large urban areas? Through the decades of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union, confronting one another as hostile adversaries, built enormous nuclear arsenals containing tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, and by the way, most of them are thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs, orders of magnitude more destructive than the primitive ones used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These two adversaries relied on nuclear deterrence to avoid a war that would have resulted in their, to their total mutual assured destruction. The common interest of the United States and the Soviet Union to survive offered us some comfort as we tottered perilously along the brink of catastrophe. And we did succeed in deterring a nuclear holocaust during the Cold War. But today, the Soviet Union no longer exists as an actively hostile adversary. It disappeared into the dustbin of history more than 22 years ago. What else did the nuclear weapons accomplish? Not the stopping the Korean War, not squashing the Hungarian and Czech uprisings. We have recently marked the 51st anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but there were other frighteningly close calls during the Cold War, including false alarms and serious accidents several of which actually came perilously close. Prior to the era of nuclear weapons, deterrence made good sense as a strategy for negotiating and compromising when appropriate to avoid direct armed conflict by all diplomatic means. But once the thermonuclear weapons turned deterrence into nuclear deterrence, or MAD, it brought with it itself great unprecedented dangers. These were recognized early on. During his presidency in 1956, President Eisenhower mentioned that war in the nuclear age, and let me quote him, his words, will no longer mean the exhaustion of the enemy and suicide. It will mean the destruction of the, excuse me, I always say that wrong, exhaustion of the enemy and surrender. It will mean the destruction of the enemy and suicide. George Kennan expressed very eloquently what is required to escape this fate in his 1981 book, The Nuclear Delusion. And here's a short quote by George Kennan, 1981. I can see no way out of this dilemma other than by a bold and sweeping departure, a departure that would cut surgically through the exaggerated anxieties, the self-engendered nightmares, and the sophisticated mathematics of destruction in which we have all entangled, have all been entangled over these recent years, and would permit us to move with courage and decision to the heart of the problem. President Ronald Reagan and General Secretary 
Mikhail Gorbachev picked up on that theme when they first met four years later in Geneva in 1985 and agreed to the statement frequently repeated since then that, quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. This led to a critical turning point in U.S. and Soviet nuclear competition one year later in 1986 at their remarkable summit in Reykjavik, Iceland. Reagan and Gorbachev spent two days in intense and painfully frustrating discussions in an effort to reach a formal agreement committing the United States and the Soviet Union to embrace the goal of a world with no nuclear weapons at all. In the end, they couldn't close the deal. And what George Shultz, who was with Reagan there, uh, Reykjavik, has called the highest stakes poker game ever played. The cooperation and trust between the two countries that would be required for them to work together toward achieving this goal simply didn't exist then. And the hope for that agreement faltered on their failure to reach agreement on how to limit work on ballistic missile defenses. And I'm going to return to that point in a few minutes. The very notion of removing all nuclear weapons discussed at Reykjavik caused a huge furor among many of the nuclear mandarins who considered it dangerous and heretical. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher flew to Washington immediately after the summit to see President Reagan. When she arrived in Washington, she summoned the Secretary of State, George Shultz, to the British Embassy and went at him saying, George, how can you sit there and allow the president to agree to abolish all nuclear weapons? George replied, but Margaret, he's the president. To which Margaret replied, yes, but you're supposed to be the one with his feet on the ground. To which George replied, but Margaret, I agree with him. <laughs> Despite their failure to close a deal, the Reykjavik summit was an important event. The two leaders who had the power to launch 98% of the existing nuclear weapons had committed themselves publicly and officially to start reducing nuclear arsenals. And indeed, just one year later, they negotiated the removal of all intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe and around the world. Reykjavik also led to important progress in reducing the total number of nuclear bombs that today number far less than one third of their peak number in 1986, which was 70,000. Not 17, 70,000. But the numbers of remaining nuclear weapons are still staggering in the many thousands for both Russia and the United States who still possess more than 90% of the, all of the existing nuclear bombs. We remain caught in the Cold War trap of nuclear deterrence more than two decades after the demise of the Soviet Union. A growing concern that the world seemed to be inexorably approaching a tipping point with nuclear proliferation getting out of control Iran, North Korea, et cetera, moved George Shultz and me at Stanford to action. We enlisted three distinguished former senior government officials with impeccable records, like George himself, as Cold War hawks, Senator Sam Nunn, Secretary Kissinger, and Secretary Bill Perry, to join us and organized a conference on the 20th anniversary of Reykjavik on October 2006. We had three goals, three goals. One, to see what we could learn from that experience at Reykjavik. Two, 
to figure out what conditions would be required to convince ourselves and others that a more stable and peaceful world can be established without nuclear weapons, instead of trying to preserve the two-tier system as it is today, with some nations having uh, nuclear weapons and others without. But it's a world in which a growing number of nations are rejecting it. And third, to build a global constituency. How to do that? A coalition of the willing to work together to pave a practical path toward achieving such a goal as both desirable and realistic. Out of that and subsequent conferences at Stanford, around the world, and many others, uh, uh, we uh, came to a set of specific proposals and uh, published them. We've been publishing them here, there, and elsewhere. The most influential publications appeared as op-eds in the Wall Street Journal starting in January 2007. It generated a strong worldwide response that was enthusiastically positive and gained public endorsement by two-thirds of the living ex-former U.S. Secretaries of State, Secretaries of Defense, and National Security Advisors in both parties. More importantly, our work did revive interest in pursuing a long dormant goal the right of it goal of elimination of all nuclear weapons. And an encouraging atmosphere was created. Two years later, in 2009, President Obama added his enormous weight to this call in a speech in Prague in April. He declared that, quote, the existence of thousands of nuclear weapons is the most dangerous legacy of the Cold War. He pledged to, quote, put an end to Cold War thinking, and he emphasized, quote, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Obama also recognized that this would be an enormous challenge politically as well as technically, because it wouldn't be a return to the world as it was before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The genie is out of the bottle. Nuclear weapons can be built. They have been built and they cause unparalleled devastating damage. In order, in this condition, under this condition, to make progress in achieving the vision, we must face the challenge of answering a key question. And this is the key question. Is it possible to make the case that a world free of nuclear weapons is consistent with establishing a strategic stability among nations on a global scale. Now, by strategic stability, I mean conditions discouraging breakout. That is discouraging the reconstitution of even a very small nuclear arsenal, while also at the same time providing assurances that we could respond effectively to any such attempt at a breakout capability rapidly enough to be confident of being able to defeat it. Getting to zero and monitoring the end state will require achieving an unprecedented degree of international cooperation and transparency and improvement as well in verification tools. Having just a handful of nuclear weapons illegally could make a big difference when you're down at zero. So beyond reconnaissance from our Earth-circling satellites, it will require close monitoring of all activities related to maintaining a nuclear weapons enterprise. This includes data exchanges, on-site inspections, both challenged and scheduled, tags and seals on critical components, sensors to detect effluence to show an activity that shouldn't be there, Yes, it's a very daunting challenge, but before you dismiss it as unachievable, consider it in the context of what we have already accomplished in developing cooperative means of verification. 
is Russia, the Russian Federation. Before the collapse of the Soviet Union, 22 years ago, proposals for agreements to penetrate their iron curtain of secrecy and count the number of nuclear warheads on their deployed intercontinental missiles would have been laughed out of school. Absolutely. But that and other related reciprocal inspections is precisely what we negotiated and that we are doing today in the new START treaty that entered into force in February 2011. This was a major step forward, the culmination of progress in this direction following the Reykjavik summit. We have come very far in the last two decades, and there is no reason to view this as the end of the line. Operational progress in this cooperation is proceeding on course. The success of the New START treaty negotiation with the Russians provides a template for efforts to identify and implement multinational initiatives that are perceived as necessary to establish and maintain the strategic stability in a world without nuclear weapons. And in order to generate a serious commitment from the nations around the world to work toward this goal with us, it must be understood as being credible as well as desirable. And in addition, the US will have to maintain with each step along the way the confidence of our allies who rely on our military strength and political will as their nuclear envelope. On the positive side, let me add, it is also important to recognize that during the time it will take to surmount, op to surmount obstacles and to negotiate and implement steps toward the end state, of a world without nuclear weapons, we can anticipate a steady accumulation of vital information of monitoring, but also as a result of the necessarily close working relationship among inspectors and technical personnel of the nations involved. That will be very valuable. An important initiative of this type, by the way, announced by President Obama is an expanded international effort to put all special nuclear material, that is potential bomb fuel, around the world under safe control within the next four years. He gave this a formal start in an unprecedented meeting in Washington in 2010 when 47 national leaders joined him and committed themselves to this goal. With the follow-on meeting two years later, 2012, in Seoul, Korea, South Korea, of, of more than 50 leaders which recorded significant progress. The next year in the Netherlands, there will be a third meeting to check on how well we've come to our goal and what comes next. Progress in this effort is a big deal. It should receive adequate support to persist, and we hope it will. Similar efforts are underway to gain support, universal support, for efforts to toughen the verification provisions, the verification teeth of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, that entered into force in 1970, was extended to the indefinite future in 1995, and as of this summer, has been ratified by 189 nations, all but India, Israel, North Korea and Pakistan, all latecomers to the nuclear curve. The NPT, quote, obligates all parties to pursue negotiations in good faith to nuclear disarmament, unquote. It ensures the rights of all parties to produce and use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes without discrimination. It also forbids transfer of nuclear technology between nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. The new effort to toughen the verification teeth of the NPT with what's called an additional protocol has thus far been endorsed by 141 of the treaty signatories and work is proceeding to make it an all-inclusive mandatory commitment as its goal. Beyond the non-proliferation treaty, efforts are in progress 
to establish international control of the nuclear fuel cycle, including in particular control of the nuclear fuel itself, and to negotiate a verifiable cutoff on the production of fissile fissionable material for bombs. There's a lot of work to be done. Now, I just want to mention briefly two major issues where actions by the United States are needed to advance our strategic vision. They would surely contribute to improving the atmosphere that was created in 2009, and which is to, to achieving our goal, which somehow has become kind of stagnant now. The first one is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, CTBT. President Clinton was the first signatory when it was negotiated in 1996. Currently, it is signed by 183 nations and ratified by, I wrote 159, but on Tuesday, a country in Africa, Guinea, ratified it, so the number is ratified by 160 today. But there are 44 so-called Annex II nations who have demonstrated a nuclear capacity and who must ratify the CTBT before it enters into force. 36 of those 44 nations of Annex II have done so. The eight delinquents are, again, the four, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel, plus China, Egypt, Iran, and the United States. We're in bad company. We're not in good company. All of our NATO allies, plus the Russians and the Japanese, have ratified it. It is believed that China will join us once we do. Every technical reason, not to mention the political strategic ones, support United States ratification. This is the conclusion of the most recent detailed technical study by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences issued last year. And there have been many other studies of parts and all of this that all come to that conclusion. As a result of the deeper understanding of the scientific processes during a nuclear explosion that we have gained from a strong science-based nuclear stockpile stewardship program at the weapons labs since 1992, when the United States performed its last explosive underground test. I personally believe not only can we be, be confident of the arsenal safety and reliability, which I was in 1996, but my confidence is even higher than it was then. And that was 17 uh, years ago. And that is not, let me just assure you, a casually offered judgment. Moreover, the Academy report concludes that the CTBT has, has the international monitoring system that comes with the CTBT will be able to detect explosive tests robust enough to lead to developments inimical to U.S. security interests. And they will be further enhanced, by the way, by national assets which will be included in this. There are more than 300 sensors involved in this. Seismic, acoustic, underwater, and it's more than 85% complete and operating now. I believe it is fully consistent with US interests to ratify this treaty when it comes up for the Senate's advice and consent. It would certainly constitute an important step in advancing US leadership uh, in uh, advancing the global strategic commitment to achieving a world without nuclear weapons. A second important issue for the US and Russia is to resolve the strain between them over plans to develop and deploy ballistic missile defenses, or BMDs. I believe, however, to be clear, that I believe that what's going on now between US and Russia is nothing more than uh, political sparring, if you want to call it that. 40 years ago, it was realized, albeit reluctantly, that any technically feasible BMD system can be overpowered simply, simply by increasing the firepower of the attacking offensive missile force. And doing so is possible more readily and more cheaply. That is still true today and is recognized by top government officials and scientists, including the, Ra the Russian Deputy Prime Minister, Dmitry Rogozin, who recently, very recently, stated in Moscow that Russia will have no trouble penetrating US planned defenses 
of President Hogan, nor does the U.S. Think, think, think any differently, by the way. When President Reagan, in 1983, in his famous speech, called on, quote, the U.S. scientific community who gave us nuclear weapons to apply their great talents to render them impotent and obsolete, his words, standing alone, standing alone, invited an interpretation as a call for a major effort to build a bold new BMD system, an impenetrable multi-layer astrodome against thousands of Soviet missiles and warheads, which then existed. That is precisely how they were aggressively interpreted by many in his administration, especially the Pentagon and some of their scientific advisors, who immediately set out to design and to build such a so-called Star Wars shield. Let me say what we now know. Their grossly excessive claims and promises were subsequently defeated by the unaccommodating laws of nature. We now know from an extensive literature of Reagan's public and private speeches, many released to the public only in recent years, that Ronald Reagan was in fact a deeply committed nuclear abolitionist. That was without a doubt his vision in a remarkable letter, a seven page letter he wrote directly to Gorbachev on July 25th, 1986, some 11 weeks before that famous Reykjavik summit. I want to read you a paragraph from it. I believe you would agree, Gorbachev, that significant commitments of this type with respect to strategic defenses would make sense only if made in conjunction with the implementation of immediate actions on both sides to begin moving toward our common goal of the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Toward this goal, I believe we also share the view that the process must begin with radical and stabilizing reductions in the offensive nuclear arsenals of both the United States and the Soviet Union. The role for, end of quote, the role for ballistic missile defenses that Reagan clearly had in mind and expressed in that 1986 letter, if not evident in his 1983 Star Wars speech or in his administration's subsequent actions, was limited to providing protection against a small number of missiles and thereby countering a very limited threat retained or built covertly by a treaty violator. Such a limited defensive capability, I believe, is key to achieving strategic stability by being able to counter efforts to reconstitute covertly. It is both practical and an important goal. If only the two countries had developed a level of mutual trust in 1986 to accept these words as meaning precisely what they said. Today, their importance cannot be denied or deferred. In view of the decreasing value and increasing hazards of the current condition of nuclear deterrence, achieving the vision of a world without nuclear weapons is an urgent challenge. The answer to the question in the title of this talk is clearly a resounding no. Furthermore, it is a fundamental moral challenge when you consider the consequences of failure. As Freeman wrote in his 1984 book, Weapons and Hope, quote, it is immoral to base our policy upon the threat to carry out a massacre of innocent people greater than all the massacres in mankind's bloody history. The dilemma we face today, finally, in our posture of mutual assured destruction, the MAD, is superbly summed up in a speech at Stanford University given by Father Brian Hayer, a leading scholar on this subject. He said, for millennia, people believed if anyone had the right to call the ultimate moment of truth, one must name that person God. 
since the dawn of the nuclear age, we have progressively acquired the capability to call the ultimate moment of truth. And we are not gods, but that we must live with. That is what we must live with because we have created. Thank you.